I'm Meg Blanchett with O'Reilly Media, and we have Matthew Gast here, who is the Director of Product Management at Arrowhive Networks. Um, we're going to talk about 802.11ac, and can you start by explaining what that is? Well, the way that I like to explain it is that way back when Scott Adams, when he was writing a Dilbert cartoon, he had Dogbert explain why Y2K was so scary, and it's because it was big and round. And 802.11ac is a wireless LAN standard, so if you want to connect over Wi-Fi, it's the, the next one in sequence. But what makes it really interesting is the throughput is big and round. It's a gigabit. That is exciting because? Because it's a big and round speed. <laughs> <clears throat> when you look at what people are trying to do with wireless technology, it's really, it's replaced wires everywhere. When I was in college many years ago, although I'm not gray yet, mm -hmm. at least I, I hope the camera doesn't make me gray. <laughs> I wrote a proposal for the, the college I went to to put in Ethernet everywhere in, in dorm rooms. And now, you would never even think of doing that. The amazing thing about Wi-Fi is that it makes me feel kind of like an anachronism for actually knowing what an Ethernet jack looks like and knowing how to use one and knowing that it's not something I plug my telephone into. Okay. And if we dig into the details a little bit, um, can you tell me what is QAM? And why does 256 <laughs> QAM make it go faster? QAM, or Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, if you want the mouthful, is a technique that's used to encode data as it travels through um, a network medium. And it encodes data both on the amplitude change, which everybody understands. Um, I could shout here, but that would make it hard to edit the video together mm -hmm. if I'm going to vary the level of my voice. So you can vary the, the amplitude. You can also vary the phase so that if you look at a wave, it, it'll have peaks. And you can have peaks like this, and then, so this is in phase, because they match up. These are out of phase, and so you can vary the phase shift between the two. And you combine these two techniques, amplitude and phase, to encode data. The simplest form of this modulation is I'm going to have just two data points. And since I'm transmitting digital data, I'll call them one and zero. And it's very easy because it's like, it's like a dartboard and you have two spots on it. You throw a dart and it's likely to be either one or zero. You don't have to be that good a dart player to do it. You, however, it doesn't make the, the network very fast. So to make it faster, you wind up packing in multiple bits into each one of these time periods. And the more you have, the more data you transmit. So you go up from having uh, what's called binary keying or BPSK which has two to quadrature, which is four, and then you go to 16 qualm and 64 qualm. And then if you really want to be a good dart thrower, you have 256 qualm, which means that you have this whole constellation of 256 points. And that enables you to transmit a couple more bits every little time slice, and that makes the network a lot faster. And why is everything sent as an aggregate frame? 802.11n introduced this idea of having an aggregate frame, and it's almost like your data decides to carpool. So that in 802.11, one of the most important ways that we manage access to the network, or actually to the network medium, is it's actually the silence has meaning. And when the, the network medium has been quiet for a while, then you know that you can transmit. Well, the thing is, as we go to gigabit speed, silence is actually really expensive because you're foregoing the right to transmit a lot of data. So what we did in 802.11n is we introduced this idea of an aggregate frame that rather than listening to make sure the medium was free and transmitting it and then waiting to make sure it was free again, once we know it's free because we can transmit so fast, then we're just going to transmit them all right in a row, back to back. In 802.11ac, everything is sent as an aggregate frame, even if it's just one. And this is kind of an interesting little note that a lot of people don't appreciate because they don't have to. Um, and the reason for it is that a single frame of data in 802.11ac can actually be up to a megabyte. And you need so many bits to it, describe how big that is that we'd have to make the header bigger. But by moving the information out of the header, which is transmitted slow, you know, we're throwing darts and qualm, that's the, I've only got two targets, we can move that into the payload, where we can transmit it using 256 qualm much faster, and so it doesn't cost as much to send this big, long length field. 
And how does 802.11ac share radio capacity between two networks? With the new wider channels in 802.11ac, so originally everything was a 20 megahertz channel. Then with 802.11n, we went to 40. Well, if, if 20 is good, 40 must be twice as good, right? In 802.11ac, we're introducing 80 and 160 megahertz channels because it's, it's like a cake. Is there such a thing as too much? Then <clears throat> the, the, uh, the problem that comes in with that is that you'll have devices which are typically small and battery powered. So things like phones or tablets, they use the, the narrow channels <clears throat> because what's important for them is the amount of battery life they have, not necessarily the speed. Um, whereas if you look at a device like a laptop, it's typically plugged into power. It, you, you care a lot about speed. You might be watching complex or high definition video and you really care about speed. So something that 802.11ac does very well is it allows two networks that share the same very wide channel. So let's say they, they share an 80 megahertz channel. That if you have two networks that are next to each other, they can actually transmit 40 megahertz frames independently. So um, this is much easier to illustrate um, in, uh, with, a, with a whiteboard or with a book. Um, and being able to explain a figure. But roughly, let's say we have 80 megahertz of spectrum here. And obviously, you can transmit 40 megahertz frames independently. To do 80, you have to wait for both channels to be quiet. And 802.11ac includes a way for a transmitter to say, I have a frame. I'd like to use 80 megahertz and to allow everything else to say, no, you can only have 40 for this one. And there's a way to back off and to effectively share with your neighbors. And will there be distinct waves to the introduction of 802.11ac products? When you have a complex specification, it's about 300 pages right now in its current draft, it's very difficult to implement the whole thing at once. Many times what you wind up with in a technical standard is it's easy to understand how you would build a frame that looks like um, a particular um, attribute. So a good example is in 802.11n, one of the important things that we had was this idea of MIMO. And so you have these, you can transmit multiple data streams over the same channel. Maybe one goes this way and one bounces off and you can have up to four. Well, it's very clear how to write a standard that says we can transmit four. Building a product that actually does it is much more complicated. Um, and in the case of um, a radio device, a lot of times one of the big limiting factors is that you have all the antennas right next to each other and they can e easily interfere with each other. So um, 802.11ac has the same amount of complexity um, and therefore the first wave of products will do some of these simpler features that are much easier to understand. Um, so for the, the first wave we'll have a lot of 80 megahertz products. Uh, the typical speed of many devices will probably be around 1.3 gigabits, which is a lot but the standard goes all the way up to about 7. So the first wave is only 1.3. Uh, the second wave probably gets us closer to 3.5. And, a half. and um, the, some of the most exciting technology actually doesn't come until the second wave, which is something called multi-user MIMO. That's actually way beyond the, the ability to, to talk about in a little interview like this. But it's, it, it's a way of transmitting to multiple receivers at once so when I say 1.3 gigabits, it might be 1.3 gigabits to multiple locations at the same time. So it's actually a lot faster than it sounds. And do you have an idea of when we'll be seeing these waves? In 802.11, there's a distinction between uh, the, the two major markets. There are consumer-grade products that you use in your home, and you run down to the store, you say, I want Wi-Fi today, and you pick one off the shelf and bring it home, and you have a Wi-Fi network. Then there are more complex products, like the ones that we build at Arrowhive, that are used to build large-scale networks so that you can use them in the office. And for example, you can actually walk around while still connected. And it's much easier to build the, the former kind of product than the latter. So we're starting to see those already. The um, higher-end products are going to come out probably the middle of next year. Um, with the first wave, the second wave will come sometime in 2014. And it's a really exciting time to be in Wi-Fi. 
we're, uh, as, as an industry, we're working on a certification program that will give buyers the assurance that this technology is interoperable um, because what good is a network if you can't actually move data from point A to point B? Well, that's good to look forward to. And thank you very much for explaining all this to us today. You're very welcome.